Chapter 1 Mr. Lockwood Visits Wuthering Heights 1801 I have just returned from a visit to my landlord, Mr. Heathcliff. I am delighted with the house I am renting from him. Thrushcross Grange is miles away from any town or village. That suits me perfectly. And the scenery here in Yorkshire is so beautiful. Mr. Heathcliff, in fact, is my only neighbour, and I think his character is similar to mine. He does not like people either. My name is Lockwood, I said, when I met him at the gate to his house. I'm renting Thrushcross Grange from you. I just wanted to come and introduce myself. He said nothing, but frowned, and did not encourage me to enter. After a while, however, he decided to invite me in. Joseph, take Mr. Lockwood's horse, he called, and bring up some wine from the cellar. Joseph was a very old servant, with a sour expression on his face. He looked crossly up at me as he took my horse. God help us, a visitor he muttered to himself. Perhaps there were no other servants, I thought, and it seemed that Mr. Heathcliff hardly ever received guests. His house is called Wuthering Heights. The name means a windswept house on a hill, and it is a very good description. The trees around the house do not grow straight, but are bent by the north wind which blows over the moors every day of the year. Fortunately, the house is strongly built, and is not damaged even by the worst winter storms. The name Earnshaw is cut into a stone over the front door. Mr. Heathcliff and I entered the huge main room. It could have been any Yorkshire farmhouse kitchen, except that there was no sign of cooking, and no farmer sitting at the table. Mr. Heathcliff certainly does not look like a farmer. His hair and skin are dark, like a gypsy's, but he has the manners of a gentleman. He could perhaps take more care with his appearance, but he is handsome. I think he is proud, and also unhappy. We sat down by the fire, in silence. Joseph! shouted Mr. Heathcliff. No answer came from the cellar, so he dived down there, leaving me alone with several rather fierce looking dogs. Suddenly, one of them jumped angrily up at me, and in a moment all the others were attacking me. From every shadowy corner in the great room appeared a growling animal ready to kill me, it seemed. Help! Mr. Heathcliff, help! I shouted, trying to keep the dogs back. My landlord and his servant were in no hurry to help, and could not have climbed the cellar steps more slowly. But luckily a woman, who I supposed was the housekeeper, rushed into the room to calm the dogs. What the devil is the matter? Mr. Heathcliff asked me rudely when he finally entered the room. Your dog, sir, I replied. You shouldn't leave a stranger with them. They're dangerous. Come, come, Mr. Lockwood. Have some wine. We don't often have strangers here, and I'm afraid neither I nor my dogs are used to receiving them. I could not feel offended after this, and accepted the wine. We sat drinking and talking together for a while. I suggested visiting him tomorrow. He did not seem eager to see me again, but I shall go anyway. I am interested in him, even if he isn't interested in me. Two days later... 
Yesterday afternoon was misty and bitterly cold, but I walked the four miles to Wuthering Heights and arrived just as it was beginning to snow. I banged on the front door for ten minutes, getting colder and colder. Finally, Joseph's head appeared at a window of one of the farm buildings. What do you want? He growled. Could you let me in? I asked desperately. He shook his head. There's only Mrs. Heathcliff indoors, and she won't open the door to you. Just then, a young man appeared and called me to follow him. We went through the back door, and into the big room where I had been before. I was delighted to see a warm fire, and a table full of food. And this time there was a woman sitting by the fire. She must be Mrs. Heathcliff, I thought. I had not imagined my landlord was married. She looked at me coldly, without saying anything. Terrible weather, I remarked. There was silence. What a beautiful animal! I tried again, pointing to one of the dogs that had attacked me. She still said nothing, but got up to make the tea. She was only about seventeen, with the most beautiful little face I had ever seen. Her golden wavy hair fell around her shoulders. Have you been invited to tea? She asked me crossly. No, but you are the proper person to invite me. I smiled. For some reason, this really annoyed her. She stopped making the tea, and threw herself angrily back in her chair. Meanwhile, the young man was staring aggressively at me. He looked like a farm worker, but seemed to be part of the family. I did not feel at all comfortable. At last, Heathcliff came in. Here I am, sir, as I promised. I said cheerfully. You shouldn't have come," he answered, shaking the snow off his clothes. "You'll never find your way back in the dark. Perhaps you could lend me a servant to guide me back to the Grange," I asked. "No, I couldn't. There aren't any servants here except Joseph, and the housekeeper. Get the tea ready, will you?" he added fiercely to the young woman. I was shocked by his unpleasantness. We sat down to eat. I tried to make conversation with the three silent people round the table. How happy you must be, Mister Heathcliff! I began, in this quiet place, with your wife and my wife, my wife's ghost. You mean? I suddenly realized I had made a serious mistake. So his wife was dead. Of course, he was too old to be married to that young girl. She must be married to the young man next to me, who was drinking his tea out of a bowl and eating his bread with unwashed hands. Perhaps the poor girl had found no one better to marry in this uninhabited area. I turned politely to the young man. Ah, so you are this lady's husband. This was worse than before. His face went red, and he seemed only just able to stop himself hitting me. He muttered something I could not hear. Wrong again, Mister Lockwood," said Mister Heathcliff. "No, her husband, my son, is dead. This," he added, looking scornfully at the young man. Is certainly not my son. My name is Hareton Earnshaw," growled the young man. We finished our meal in silence, and when I looked out of the window, all I could see was darkness and snow. I don't think I can get home without a guide," I said politely. No one answered me. 
I turned to the woman. Mrs. Heathcliff, I begged. What can I do? Please, help me. Take the road you came on, she replied without interest, opening a book. That's the best advice I can give. Mr. Heathcliff, I'll have to stay here for the night, I told him. I hope that will teach you not to walk over the moors in bad weather, he answered. I don't keep guest bedrooms. You can share a bed with Hareton or Joseph. I was so angry with them all that I could not stay there a moment longer and rushed out into the darkness. I saw Joseph by the back door, caught hold of the lamp he was carrying and ran with it to the gate. But the dogs chased after me and attacked me and I was soon knocked to the ground. Heathcliff and Hareton stood at the door, laughing, as I shouted at the dogs and tried to get up. In the end, I was again rescued by the housekeeper, Zilla, who ordered away the dogs and helped me to my feet. I was so bruised and exhausted that I did not feel strong enough to walk home. And although I did not want to, I had to spend the night at Wuthering Heights. Nobody wished me good night, as Zilla took me upstairs to find a bed for me. Chapter 2 Catherine Earnshaw's Room 1801 Quietly, sir, whispered the housekeeper as we climbed up the dark stairs. My master will be angry if he discovers which bedroom you're sleeping in. For some reason... He doesn't want anyone to sleep there. I don't know why. There's strange people in this house, you know. Here's the room, sir. But I was too tired to listen. Thank you, Zilla, I said. And taking the candle, I entered the room and closed the door. The only piece of furniture in the large, dusty bedroom was a bed placed next to the window. There were heavy curtains, which could be pulled around it, to hide the sleeper from anyone else in the room. Looking inside the curtains, I saw a little shelf full of books just under the window. I put my candle down on the shelf and dropped thankfully onto the bed. I closed the curtains around the bed, and felt safe from Heathcliff and everyone else at Wuthering Heights. I noticed that there were names written on the wall in childish handwriting. Catherine Earnshaw, Catherine Heathcliff, and Catherine Linton. Then I fell asleep, but I was woken very suddenly by a smell of burning. My candle had fallen onto a Bible on the shelf and was burning it. When I opened the Bible to see if it was damaged, I found that wherever there was an empty page, or half a page, someone had written on it. And on the first page was written, Catherine Earnshaw's Diary, 1776. Who was the girl who had slept in this bed, written her name on the wall, and then written her diary in the Bible twenty-five years ago? I read it with interest. How I hate my brother Hindley, it began. He is so cruel to poor Heathcliff. If only my father hadn't died... While he was alive, Heathcliff was like a brother to Hindley and me. But now Hindley and his wife Frances have inherited the house and the money, and they hate Heathcliff. That horrible old servant Joseph is always angry with Heathcliff and me because we don't pray or study the Bible. And when he tells his master... 
Hindley always punishes us. I can't stop crying. Poor Heathcliff. Hindley says he is wicked and can't play with me or eat with me any more. My eyes were beginning to close again, and I fell asleep. Never before had I passed such a terrible night, disturbed by the most frightening dreams. Suddenly, I was woken by a gentle knocking on the window. It must be the branch of a tree, I thought, and tried to sleep again. Outside, I could hear the wind driving the snow against the window. I could not sleep. The knocking annoyed me so much that I tried to open the window. When it did not open, I broke the glass angrily and stretched out my hand towards the branch. But instead, my fingers closed around a small, ice-cold hand. It held my hand tightly, and a voice cried sadly, Let me in! Let me in. Who are you? I asked, trying to pull my hand away. Catherine Linton, it replied. I've come home. I lost my way. There seemed to be a child's face looking in at the window. Terror made me cruel. I rubbed the creature's tiny wrist against the broken glass so that blood poured down onto the bed. As soon as the cold fingers let go for a moment, I pulled my hand quickly back, put a pile of books in front of the broken window, and tried not to listen to the desperate cries outside. "'Go away!' I called. "'I'll never let you in!' Not if you go on crying for twenty years. It is almost twenty years, replied the sad little voice. I've been out here in the dark for nearly twenty years. The hand started pushing through the window at the pile of books, and I knew it would find me and catch hold of me again. Unable to move, I stared in horror at the shape behind the glass and screamed. There were rapid footsteps outside my bedroom door, and then I saw the light of a candle in the room. Is anyone here? whispered Heathcliff. He could not see me behind the curtains and clearly did not expect an answer. I knew I could not hide from him, so I opened the curtains wide. I was surprised by the effect of my action. Heathcliff dropped his candle and stood without moving, his face as white as the wall behind him. He did not seem to recognise me. "'It's only your guest, Lockwood,' I said. "'I'm sorry,' I must have had a bad dream and screamed in my sleep. To the devil with you, Mr. Lockwood, growled my landlord. Who allowed you to sleep in this room? Who was it? It was your housekeeper, Mr. Heathcliff, I said, quickly putting my clothes on. And I'm angry with her myself. No one can sleep in a room full of ghosts. What do you mean? asked Heathcliff, looking suddenly very interested. Ghosts, you say? That little girl, Catherine Linton, or Earnshaw, or whatever her name was, must have been wicked. She told me she had been a ghost for nearly twenty years. It was probably a punishment for her wickedness. How dare you speak of her to me, cried Heathcliff wildly. But as I described my dream, 
he became calmer and sat down on the bed, trembling as he tried to control his feelings. Mr. Lockwood, he said finally, brushing a tear from his eye. You can go into my bedroom to sleep for the rest of the night. I'll stay here for a while. No more sleep for me tonight, I replied. I'll wait in the kitchen until it's daylight, and then I'll leave. You needn't worry about my visiting you again, either. I've had enough company for a long time. But as I turned to go downstairs, my landlord, thinking he was alone, threw himself on the bed, pushed open the window, and called into the darkness. Come in! Come in! he cried tears rolling down his face. Catherine, do come! My darling, hear me this time! But only the snow and wind blew into the room. How could my dream have produced such madness? I could not watch his suffering any more and went downstairs. I waited in the kitchen until it was light enough outside for me to find my way through the deep snow back to Thrushcross Grange. The housekeeper there, Ellen Dean, rushed out to welcome me home. She thought I must have died in the previous night's snowstorm. With a warm fire and a hot meal, I began to recover from my unpleasant experiences. After my stay at Wuthering Heights, I thought I would never want to speak to any human being again. But by the end of the next day, I was beginning to feel lonely. I decided to ask Mrs. Dean to sit with me after supper. How long have you lived in this house? I asked her. Eighteen years, sir. I came here early in 1783, when my mistress was married, to look after her. And when she died, I stayed here as housekeeper. Who was your mistress? I asked. Her name was Catherine Earnshaw, she replied. Ah, my ghostly Catherine. I muttered quietly to myself. She married Mr. Edgar Linton, a neighbour, added Mrs. Dean, and they had a daughter, Cathy, who married Mr. Heathcliff's son. Ah, so that must be the widow, young Mrs. Heathcliff at Wuthering Heights. That's right, sir. Did you see her? I looked after her as a baby, you know. How is she? I do want to know. She looked very well, and very beautiful. But I don't think she's happy. Oh, poor thing. And what did you think of Mr Heathcliff? He's a rough, hard man, Mrs Dean but I'm very interested in him. Tell me more about him. Well, he's very rich, of course, and mean at the same time. He could live here at Thrushcross Grange, which is a finer house than Wuthering Heights, but he would rather receive rent than live comfortably. But I'll tell you the whole story of his life, as much as I know, that is, and then you can judge for yourself. Chapter 3 Ellen Dean's Story Catherine and Heathcliff as Children 1770 
When I was a child, I was always at Wuthering Heights because my mother was a servant with the Earnshaw family. They are a very old family who have been in that house for centuries, as you can see from their name on the stone over the front door. I grew up with Catherine and Hindley Earnshaw, and we three played together as children. One day, their father, Mr Earnshaw, came back from a long journey. He had travelled sixty miles to Liverpool and back on business and was very tired. Look what I've brought you, he told us all, unwrapping something he was holding carefully in his arms. Catherine and Hindley were expecting presents and they rushed eagerly to see what it was. They were very disappointed to see only a dirty, black-haired gypsy child. I found him all alone in the busy streets of Liverpool, Mr Earnshaw explained to them. And I couldn't leave him to die. He can sleep in your room. But Hindley and Catherine were angry because they had not received any presents and refused to let the strange child share their room. However, Mr Earnshaw insisted, and little by little the boy became accepted by the family. He was called Heathcliff as a first and last name. No one ever discovered who his parents had been. Catherine and he became great friends, but Hindley hated him and was often cruel to him. Old Mr Earnshaw was strangely fond of this gypsy child and frequently punished his son for behaving badly to Heathcliff. Hindley began to be jealous of his father's feelings for Heathcliff and saw them both as enemies. The situation could not last. As Mr Earnshaw grew old and ill, Heathcliff became even more his favourite, and Hindley often quarrelled with his father. When Hindley was sent away to study, I hoped that we would have peace in the house. But then it was that old servant Joseph who caused trouble. He tried to persuade his master to be stricter with the children and was always complaining that Heathcliff and Catherine did not spend enough time studying the Bible or attending church services. Catherine was a wild, wicked girl in those days. We had to watch her every moment of the day to stop her playing her tricks on us. She was proud and liked giving orders. But she had the prettiest face and the sweetest smile you've ever seen. I could forgive her anything when she came to say she was sorry. She was much too fond of Heathcliff, and the worst punishment we could invent was to keep her separate from him. Her father could no longer understand her or her behaviour, and Catherine did not realise that his illness made him less patient with her. At last, Mr Earnshaw found peace. He died quietly in his chair by the fire one October evening in 1775. The night was wild and stormy, and we were all sitting together in the big kitchen. Joseph was reading his Bible at the table, while Catherine had her head on her father's knee. He was pleased to see her so gentle for once, and she was singing him to sleep. I was glad the old gentleman was sleeping so well. But when it was time to go to bed, Catherine put her arms round her father's neck to say good night and immediately screamed. Oh, he's dead, Heathcliff! He's dead! Heathcliff and I started crying loudly and bitterly too. Joseph told me to fetch the doctor so I ran to the village, although I knew it was too late. When I came back, I went to the children's room 
to see if they needed me, and I listened for a moment at their door. They were imagining the dead man in a beautiful, distant place, far from the troubles of this world. And as I listened, crying silently, I could not help wishing we were all there safe together. Chapter 4 Catherine Earnshaw gets to know the Lintons. 1775 Hindley came home for his father's burial. What was more surprising was that he brought a wife with him. She was called Frances, a thin, pale woman with a frequent cough. Now that Hindley was the master of the house, he ordered Joseph and me to spend our evenings in the small back kitchen as we were only servants while he, his wife and Catherine sat in the main room. Catherine and Heathcliff were treated very differently. Catherine received presents and could continue her lessons, but Heathcliff was made to work on the farm with the men and, as a farm worker, was only allowed to eat with us in the back kitchen. They grew up like two wild animals. Hindley did not care what they did as long as they kept out of his way, and they did not care even if he punished them. They often ran away onto the moors in the morning and stayed out all day, just to make Hindley angry. I was the only one who cared what happened to the two poor creatures, and I was afraid for them. One Sunday evening, they were missing at bedtime, and Hindley ordered me angrily to lock the front door. But I did not want them to stay out in the cold all night, so I kept my window open to look out for them. In a while, I saw Heathcliff walking through the gate. I was shocked to see him alone. Where's Catherine? I cried sharply. At Thrushcross Grange, with our neighbours, the Lintons, he replied. Let me in, Ellen, and I'll explain what happened. I went down to unlock the door, and we came upstairs very quietly. Don't wake the master up, I whispered. Now tell me. Well, Catherine and I thought we'd just walk to the Lintons' house. We wanted to see if Isabella and Edgar Linton are punished all the time by their parents, as we are. Probably not, I answered. I expect they are good children and don't need to be punished. Nonsense, Ellen. Guess what we saw when we looked in at their sitting room window? A very pretty room with soft carpets and white walls. Catherine and I would love to have a room like that. But in the middle of this beautiful room, Isabella and Edgar Linton were screaming and fighting over a little dog. How stupid they are, Ellen. If Catherine wanted something, I would give it to her, and she would do the same for me. I would rather be here at Wuthering Heights with her, even if I'm punished by Joseph and that wicked Hindley, than at Thrushcross Grange with those two fools. Not so loud, Heathcliff. But you still haven't told me why Catherine isn't with you. Well, as we were looking in, we started laughing at them so loudly that they heard us and sent the dogs after us. We were about to run away when a great fierce dog caught Catherine's leg in its teeth. I attacked it and made it let go of her leg, but the Linton servants appeared and caught hold of me. They must have thought we were robbers. Catherine was carried unconscious into the house and they pulled me inside too. All the time, I was shouting and swearing at them. 
What a wicked pair of thieves, said old Mr. Linton. The boy must be a gypsy. He's as dark as the devil. Mrs. Linton raised her hands in horror at the sight of me. Catherine opened her eyes and Edgar looked closely at her. Mother, he whispered, the young lady is Miss Earnshaw of Wuthering Heights. I've seen her in church occasionally. And look what our dog has done to her leg. It's bleeding badly. Miss Earnshaw? With a gypsy? cried Mrs Linton. Surely not. But I think you must be right, Edgar. This girl is wearing black. And Mr Earnshaw died recently. It must be her. I'd better put a bandage on her leg at once. Why does her brother Hindley let her run around with such a companion? wondered Mr Linton. I remember now. He's the gypsy child Mr Earnshaw brought home from Liverpool a few years ago. He's a wicked boy. You can see that, said Mrs Linton. And did you hear the bad language he used just now? I'm shocked that my children heard it. I was pushed out into the garden, but I stayed to watch through the window. They put Catherine on a comfortable sofa, cleaned her wound and fed her with cakes and wine. I only left the house when I was sure she was well taken care of. She's a breath of fresh air for those stupid Lintons. I'm not surprised they like her. Everybody who sees her must love her, mustn't they, Ellen? I'm afraid you'll be punished for this, Heathcliff, I said sadly, and I was right. Hindley warned Heathcliff that he must never speak to Catherine again or he would be sent away from Wuthering Heights, and it was decided that Catherine would be taught to behave like a young lady. She stayed with the Linton family at Thrushcross Grange for five weeks until Christmas. By that time, her leg was fine, and her manners were much better than before. Frances Earnshaw visited her often, bringing her pretty dresses to wear, and persuading her to take care of her appearance, so that when she finally came home after her long absence, she almost seemed a different person. Instead of a wild, hatless girl, we saw a beautiful, carefully dressed young lady. When she had greeted all of us, she asked for Heathcliff. Come forward, Heathcliff, called Hindley. You may welcome Miss Catherine home, like the other servants. Heathcliff was used to being outside all day and had not bothered to wash or change his clothes. His face and hands were black with dirt. In spite of this, Catherine was very glad to see him and rushed up to kiss him. Then she laughed. How funny and black and cross you look! But that's because I'm used to Edgar and Isabella, who are always so clean and tidy. Well, Heathcliff, have you forgotten me? But ashamed and proud, the boy said nothing, until suddenly his feelings were too much for him. I won't stay to be laughed at, he cried, and was about to run away when Catherine caught hold of his hand. Why are you angry, Heathcliff? You... You just look a bit strange, that's all. You're so dirty. She looked worriedly at her hands and her new dress. You needn't have touched me, he said, pulling away his hand. I like being dirty, and I'm going to be dirty. As he ran miserably out of the room... Hindley and his wife laughed loudly, delighted that their plan to separate the two young people seemed to be succeeding. The next day, 
was Christmas Day. Edgar and Isabella Linton had been invited to lunch, and their mother had agreed on condition that her darlings were kept carefully apart from that wicked boy. I felt sorry for poor Heathcliff, and while the Earnshaws were at church, I helped him wash and dress in clean clothes. You're too proud, I scolded him as I brushed his black hair. You should think how sad Catherine is when you can't be together. And don't be jealous of Edgar Linton. I wish I had blue eyes and fair hair like him. I wish I behaved well and was going to inherit a fortune. He has none of your intelligence or character. And if you have a good heart, you'll have a handsome face. Who knows who your parents were? Perhaps a king and queen, far more important than the Lintons. In this way, I encouraged Heathcliff to have more confidence in himself. But when the Earnshaws and the Lintons arrived back from church, the first thing Hindley did was shout at Heathcliff. Get out of my sight until we've finished eating! I'll pull that long hair of yours if you don't obey me at once. It is long, said Edgar. I'm surprised he can see anything. This was too much for Heathcliff. He looked desperately around for a weapon, picked up a bowl of hot soup and threw it at Edgar, who started screaming. Hindley immediately took hold of Heathcliff and pushed him upstairs. I'm sure Hindley's going to hit him, cried Catherine. I hate it when Heathcliff is punished. It's your fault, Edgar. You annoyed him. Why did you speak to him? I didn't, replied Edgar, tears in his eyes. I promised Mother I wouldn't. I spoke about him, not to him. Well, don't cry, said Catherine with scorn. You've made enough trouble already. Here comes my brother. Hindley returned, hot and breathless. That'll teach him, he said. And now let's have lunch. The others seemed to forget Heathcliff. But I noticed Catherine could not eat much, and I knew she was sorry for her friend. In the evening, there was music from a travelling band and dancing in the main room. Catherine said the music sounded sweeter from high up, and so she went to sit in the dark on the stairs. When I went to find her, however, I discovered she had gone right to the top of the house to talk to Heathcliff through his locked bedroom door and had then climbed out onto the roof and in through his window. I persuaded them both to come out of the room the same way as I had no key to the door and took Heathcliff down into the warm servant's kitchen with me while Catherine returned to her guests and the dancing. You must be hungry, Heathcliff, I said. You haven't eaten all day. Have some Christmas cake, do. I can't eat anything, he growled, putting his head in his hands. I've got to think how I can have my revenge on Hindley. I only hope he doesn't die first. He'll be sorry he's treated me like this, Ellen. Chapter 5 Catherine and Edgar, 1778 In the summer of this year, Hindley's wife Frances had her first and last baby. They called the boy Hareton, but the poor woman had been ill for a long time, although we had not realised it and died soon after Hareton was born. Hindley only had room in his heart for two people, himself and his wife. So when she died, he was in despair. He neither cried nor prayed. 
Instead, he swore at God and man and drank himself to sleep every night. The servants all left him, except for Joseph and me. Joseph enjoyed being able to scold his wicked employer with warnings from the Bible, and I could not leave Miss Catherine. After all, I had grown up with her and Hindley. But the master's behaviour was a bad example for Catherine and Heathcliff. At fifteen, Catherine was the most beautiful girl for miles around, but she was proud and quick-tempered. She led what was almost a double life. At Wuthering Heights, under Heathcliff's influence, she annoyed Hindley, laughed at Joseph and was rude to me. But at Thrushcross Grange, which she often visited, she showed a different, calmer side of her character and was polite, intelligent and amusing. The Lintons all liked her and poor Edgar had fallen in love with her. Heathcliff was sixteen at this time. He did not have time to study any more, and the long hours of work on the farm made him tired and dull. There was always an angry expression on his face, and he did not even try to keep himself clean and tidy. He seemed to want people to dislike him. Catherine and he still spent time together when he was not working in the fields, but he no longer expressed his fondness for her in words, and he looked angry if she touched or kissed him. One afternoon, when Hindley had gone into town, Heathcliff came into the main room after lunch. I was helping Catherine to arrange her hair, as she had invited Edgar Linton to visit her while Hindley was absent. Catherine... Are you going anywhere this afternoon? asked Heathcliff. Why have you got that silk dress on? Nobody's visiting you, I hope. No, I don't think so, replied Catherine, looking quickly at me. But you should be at work by now, Heathcliff. That devil Hindley isn't away very often. I'm taking a holiday. I won't work any more today. I'm staying with you this afternoon. He'll never know. Catherine thought for a moment. Somehow she had to prepare him for Edgar's visit. Isabella and Edgar said they might call here this afternoon. If they come, you'll be scolded for not working. Tell Ellen to say you're busy and can't see them, he said. Those friends of yours take up all your time. You spend most of your evenings with them, not with me. Well, why should I always spend my time with you? She asked crossly. What can you talk about? How can you amuse me? You never told me before that you didn't like my company, Catherine, cried Heathcliff. Just then, we heard a horse outside and there was a light knock on the door. Edgar Linton entered, his handsome face full of delight at receiving Catherine's unexpected invitation. I wondered if Catherine was comparing her two friends as Edgar came in and Heathcliff ran out. I haven't come too soon, have I? asked Edgar politely. No, answered Catherine. Leave us alone, Ellen. I'm just doing my work, miss, I replied, pretending to dust the furniture. Hindley had told me to be present if Edgar Linton came to visit Catherine. She came up to me and whispered crossly, Go away, Ellen! Keeping her back to Edgar, she cruelly scratched my arm. Oh! I screamed to show Edgar what had happened. What a wicked thing to do, miss! You have no right to hurt me! I didn't touch you, you lying creature! She cried angrily, and unable to control herself, hit me hard on the face. Catherine, love! Catherine! 
cried Edgar, shocked. The baby Hareton, who followed me everywhere, immediately started sobbing and saying, Wicked Aunt Catherine. She picked him up and shook the poor child until he screamed. Edgar rushed up to her and tried to stop her. At once she turned and hit him over the ear as hard as she could. The young man looked very pale and went straight to the door. Where are you going, Edgar Linton? she asked. Don't leave me. I shall be miserable all night. Can I stay after you have hit me? he replied. You've made me afraid and ashamed of you. I won't come here again. Well, go then if you want to, she cried. I'm going to cry until I'm ill. And she dropped onto the floor, her shoulders shaking and the tears rolling down her face. Edgar managed to get as far as the door, but here he hesitated, and I called out to him to encourage him to leave. Miss is just a selfish child, sir. You'd better ride home and forget her. But as he could not stop looking at her, I knew there was no hope for him. Nothing would keep him away from her now. And sure enough, he came back into the room and shut the door. This time, I left them alone and stayed in the kitchen with little Hareton. But when I came to warn them that Hindley had returned, I realised that their quarrel had only brought them closer together.